Well, we hit the ball back and forth so we could make noise. Yeah, I mean, she didn't try to hit the ball where I couldn't get it. That would just waste a lot of time. <laughs> it was pretty easy. Uh, I was just nervous being in front of all those people. And I, I brought this young lady, uh, Mimi Kanarek, who was the pro at our club, to, to play with me. And she was a good player, and she fed me the ball, and then we could keep it going. The idea was to have the rallies as long as you could and put out as many lights as possible. <laughs> The tennis game slowly sort of diminishes itself in terms of uh, the brilliance of the lighting. It just and vanishes. And then the ghost game continues in the dark with the sound of the tennis rackets going in the dark. And you hear these ghost names being read in the dark. And all of a sudden, ghost people appear on these screens overhead, making unknown and unknowable kind of uh, mass uh, gestures. Not like the things that you see or associate with performance or dance or calisthenics or anything else. She needed to be able to photograph with a camera, a TV camera, uh, in the dark. Well, this required uh, infrared lenses, infrared sensitive viticons. Such devices were available at that time, but only to the military. They were classified. I happened to run across a gentleman in southern New Jersey experimenting with an imported sensitive material within the infrared range. And we were able to uh, get a promise of a infrared camera with all the infrared sensitive equipment for a demonstration, which uh, was arranged in New York at, uh, at Rauschenberg's place. It all was projected on three large screens at an angle about 20 to 30 feet high over the audience. As you were sitting, pacing, Floor, you would feel that these 500 people were on the floor, but you had no uh, understanding of where they were in space. I had a group of uh, about 500 people that I had gotten by uh, uh, donating to the Red Schoolhouse in Dalton and got the parents who were grateful for my helping the school. And I didn't want them to see anything. There was no rehearsal. Uh, they, were, they were given a list of 10 gestures. And it was made up of uh, very ordinary things that you could do. One of the, uh, the things that you had to do is in the dark. You just move around a lot and, and hug anybody that you bump into. Mm -hmm. And another one is like, pull your white handkerchief out. And all this looked great on the, on the infrared TV, mm -hmm. I thought. It was worked out that I would sit in the balcony along with a couple of other signalers, and, and we sat behind a, each had a bank of flashlights, which were in a, in a row along the railing. And we got our instructions from the master bank of, of flashlights. And if, three lights, for example, were turned on, we would then turn three from our bank on, and people below would, would then be able to see one or the other uh, sets of lights and, and then know what activity to do. And what I did was the camera, uh, the, the, the camera for Bob's piece, open score, but the, the lead up to it was that I was the cameraman in Falstrom's piece, shooting Bob. It was just a shot of Bob. I went in a tighter a couple of times until I got to a frame like that, and we held it. And, uh, and then this was on the big screen. In Falston's piece, Bob was the superstar. But in Bob's piece, the audience was the superstar. And one treated uh, the audience the same way that I treated Bob, with sort of great love and tenderness and with great care. A night vision camera which turned them all into a Nordic people. That is, they were all 
blonde in this light. As I recall, the light was a little bit green around them. Um, it looked like a huge crowd of blonde people in underwater. So 500 new stars were born. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and then only about 450 showed up the next day because Nine Evenings got such a bad review in the New York Times. Oh. <laughs> so they don't know. <laughs> they didn't want to go again. Yep. Didn't want to be in that, that they performance. They wanted to be a popular star, mm. <laughs> not just a star. When the piece is over, that's when it's over. And it's so solid and perfect at that point. You want this piece to go on forever. You want it to last, continue. Uh, but it can't continue <laughs> because, it, because it's, it's perfect the way it is. And in the second performance of the piece, there's sort of like a coda uh, at the end, uh, almost like a recap um, uh, of the song being sung in, in the sack uh, sitting there. It's almost like that uh, pop song refrain about the song has ended, but the melody lingers on. You want this piece not to stop. I thought, well, you know, this is a very hard piece to take it, as theater. And so I put uh, Simone Gisele Forte. She's a great dancer, but she sings fantastically. She does all those Italian sounds that uh, most people can't make. And so I put her in, in a bag and carried her through the audience just to soften up the performance. And the armory held the sound so nicely. It was a, a, a feast. But if it's the first time that it's never been done, there's no preparation for any sense of, of being there. And I think that's why so many people who did brave coming, probably most of their experience afterwards, thinking, I shouldn't have, but now are, are so proud. It's a very small club of people who brag about, I saw nine evenings. <laughs> That's real elite. Yes, <laughs> really. <laughs> it couldn't be done today. It was done before its time, and it's too late now. Mm. That's a rare moment. The wonderful thing about this piece is that uh, you know, like any great work of art, w when it's over, um, it's not over. You have it in your head uh, for the rest of your life.